Hi, Susan. Good morning and afternoon. <laughs> Welcome to the End of Life Journey and Beyond, The Sands of Time. My name is Lisa Straws Lawrence, and I'm a bereavement specialist. Hi, Susan. Good to see you. Hi, Lisa. Good to see you, too. I'm Susan Caperso, End of Life doula and legacy specialist. And we're happy you could join us today. And this is a really, really important topic, question that people ask. It's, it's, it's very validated to ask this question. How long will my grief last? Mm -hmm. You know, because internally, we're all feeling that and thinking that as we're going through the grief process, but it's not something that we really ask people or talk to people about. So we wanted to address a few concerns. Um, you know, it's a concern that goes through everybody's mind when they're suffering pain and sorrow of a loss. And unfortunately, there is no magic formula when it comes to grief. Yeah. A person just wants to know, when will I feel better? And initially during the first year as human beings, right, we tend to go through um, what they call different stages of grief, which we'll get into in a few minutes. But afterwards, you can expect your grief to transform in a way into something different. And this will be the long-term effects of grief. So it's different than what you've experienced before and earlier on. And it's a period when your healing process can start to begin. So today we're gonna to be talking about this in a gentle and hopefully a valuable way for you to learn more about how this process unfolds. Before we get to the stages though, Lisa, yeah. we wanted to open with something a little more intimate. Yes, absolutely. So uh, absolutely, number one, this is your journey and nobody lives that journey like you. And secondly, we both have experienced death many times. And um, personally, I have to tell you and share with all of you who are listening to this, that it is heartbreak. Uh, no matter what the situation was, no matter whether it was sudden or whether it was expected or long or short, it doesn't really matter. Um, the heartbreak I felt and have felt before of losing that loved one, you feel it. You absolutely feel it in your heart. And um, it's pain. It's painful. You feel like you can never live again. I remember waking up the next day and I expected my husband to die. I knew he was, but I just couldn't understand how come the trees were still green and the sky was still blue because my life was forever changed. Um, and I think that people feel that and see that. Um, and so we identify with that. We want all of you to know that, you know, that even after years and all, that still resonates with us. And we understand personally how that is. Sure and again, you know, we've experienced sudden deaths, uh, of people, uh, we've experienced long-term deaths, uh, but that loss is just painful. Just but this is, painful. and this is why we do this, Lisa, right? Because yeah. we don't just give the, the clinical views, as you said earlier, when we were talking, um, it's, we try and be more personal to let you know that we understand the shoes that you're standing in. And even talking about it, we can still feel the feelings. Yes. And it's been more than several years for the both of us. Yes. Um, and as I've mentioned in many videos before, to me, it's an overwhelming feeling. I always picture this big giant crane over my world and it's pushing me down deeper and deeper and deeper into the ground. And I can't get out, almost like a quicksand. Yeah. That's how I felt in the beginning. That's how it, I felt through the first year, through the second year. I mean, it, it didn't lift as quickly as I would have liked it to, but I did begin to feel some light. So right. for me, it's a cloud. Things. You know, it's interesting that all of us, it, yeah, it's like this black, yeah, the black cloud <laughs> sitting on me, you know, and yeah. trying to sort of get out of that cloud. That's how I, that's how I felt it. You know, and the yeah, everybody, will, lifting. everybody will feel their own unique right. thing. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. Maybe yes. the sun isn't shining or maybe it could be anything. But, you know, just for verbiage sake, we're trying to describe what we were each feeling and pictured in our own minds. So 
Uh, pretty quickly, we just want to go through uh, the first five stages of grief. And we're doing this because, I mean, you can pick up a book and read about them anywhere, and you can go into more depth about it. But in case you don't know about them, you really should know the steps in the process. And that helps you flow through your timeline a little better when you know, right? When you learn anything, you, you know, and you can grow from that. Yes. So there's denial, there's anger, there's bargaining, there's depression and acceptance. And again, we'll go through them a little bit just to understand them better, but just know that every stage is, takes a different amount of time to flow through depending on you because every person is different, yes. right? And I talk about that, I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but every circumstance is different. Yes. Like Lisa, you mentioned before about a loss. It's going to be different for a mother who's lost a child versus a grandchild who lost their grandparent, maybe. Yes. So every, every experience is different and everybody's personality is different. And so the relationships and the relationships are different. So that takes a toll. Yeah. And then the circumstances of the death are different. You know, you have sudden deaths and long-term deaths. So absolutely. So many factors are involved. Yes. So if we start out with denial, Lisa, I mean, denial can last from several hours to several days. And it's a state of shock, really. It's coping with the news that something just happened and it doesn't seem possible. Yes. Right? Yes. Oh, absolutely. When I got the phone call from my mother that my father back in 1984 died of a heart attack in a hotel room. I mean, you know, he was 57 and he was healthy and he was on vacation. What a shock. Just you such a just, shock. Oh, you must have just related to the, the news story. Um, I forget his name. Not the fact, the facts of life, the other one. Oh, the comedian who. Um, yeah. who oh, had, yeah, yeah. 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 The comedian. Yeah. Yes. Gilf not Gil him. Gilford Godfrey? Godfrey. No, 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 not no. him. No. Okay. No. But uh -oh. there's a few people who have. But had he's him. a well known comedian. Uh, Bob Saget. You know, Bob yeah, 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 yeah. Bob Saget. Yes. So yeah, Saget. that's what happened yeah. when he was away, maybe doing a show or what yeah, have he you. Was. His he was. family got the whole the room about the hotel room. So every circumstance is so unique to each one of us, and it's so different. But that's what that first that's what that first stage, that denial mm -hmm. stage, is all about. Because we don't want to. We don't. We don't, it's not that we don't want to accept it. We don't know how to accept it. Like what, what, yeah. what just happened? What are you telling me? No, this didn't happen. You know, it's that immediate shock phase that I talk about with a terminal ill patient. It's that first stage that it's denial. It's denial. And that's and our defense mechanism anyway, by the oh, way. Oh yeah. That keeps sure. us in, you know, up because it's just so unbelievable that how do you cope? How do you cope with that? With Almost that like a fight or flight response, right? Right, right. that's right. After denial is, the, is uh, anger. How and could that person leave me? How could that person do that? Right, <laughs> and, and lashing out, lashing out at family members and friends and other people, and even feeling angry with the person that you've lost. I remember feeling a little angry, like how did you leave me with all this? this house and these bills and this mortgage. And, and there's a part of anger there, again, depending on your relationship. I mean, or even thinking here. about the circumstances, you know, how could they do this and why did they do that? And they rehash yeah. all those situations. And right. could it have been preventable? You know, even with my husband with the flu, I mean, could it have been preventable if he, if he was eating healthier, if he wasn't smoking? I mean, you know, you get angry yeah. at these things yeah. and he could have taken care of himself better, right? Why did this yeah. have to happen? That's right. And That's right. I think the bottom line here in this anger stage is that you just have to allow, you know, you have to surrender to the circumstance. It already happened and just allow it to be because it can end up, this stage can end up eating you up for a long yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. And people, by the way, stay there. 
And I think they stay at this stage because it's their, um, it's their mechanism not to have to deal with the rest of everything in their lives. That's right. It's easier sometimes to just be angry. You know, it's interesting because anger is supposed to be a part of hurt and, um, you know, desperation and all that. So anger becomes this interesting secondary emotion for coping, for being yeah. able to move on. And people you know, stay and, with anger. And <laughs> if you have any history in your family of loss or have heard of friends that have had her history, you know, I mean, I have in my past heard this often with uh, children who've lost a parent that are maybe in the 16 to 20 year old range, um, they kind of get a little bit stuck in that anger because they don't know how to respond to things yeah. and how to deal with all these different emotions and move forward and heal. So they kind of stay in that little anger phase for a long time yeah. until something maybe disruptive happens. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. Tough stage. Um, after, after anger, Lisa, is bargaining. So uh, I'm not quite sure about this. I do know that, you know, it's not a rational phase to be in. It's not. Uh, you bargain with yourself. You bargain with others. You bargain with God. You'll do anything to bring them back. Um, I don't, I don't know. You know, do you think this is a phase, Lisa, that yeah, I, I lasts a long go, time? You no, know, I, I didn't go through that um, yeah. at all. Um, you know, he was sick for a long time or my father who just died. Um, no, I didn't really go through that at all. I didn't really I think, either. That's you know, where I, my hesitancy is with bargaining. Yeah, I think bargaining is really, especially towards when you get a, um, you know, a, an end of life kind of um, diagnosis. You know, just give me, uh, you know, a couple more months that I can just do this and this and this. Um, that's sort of a bargaining thing. But when it comes to death, and dying I, I feel like the finality was there and I don't see I mean unless it's for yourself if only I do this maybe I'll be spared something or I don't know I didn't I didn't go through that you know, at maybe all. more so with with um, loss and children you know yeah, maybe. Which, which we didn't experience so that could be a part of that as well yeah um, then we go into depression, and this can be a stage that can be long and can be debilita debilitating, right? Yes. Yes. So it's feelings of overwhelm and sorrow, and these feelings linger. They linger so much that it could be more than you can tolerate on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it feels like your sadness is never going to lift and never go away, yeah. period. Yeah, I see that and as like a quicksand. That you, yeah. that you just keep, you know, trying to get up and you keep sinking and sinking into right. the depths and, of depression. And it's good to be aware of because you may be watching this and maybe in that depression stage. And, and you really need to go through that somewhat. Not everybody does, but it's, it's a healthy way to get through the process until it goes on for much too long you know, and then you may need to reach out a little for help, or you may see somebody else who's suffering grief in your life. And maybe that depression stage is not lasting a few months or a year. Maybe it's lasting four years. Yeah. Five yeah. The years. question is, how does it impact your life? Does right. it prevent you from living, uh, doing, uh, what does it do for you? Um, right. You know, people go in and out of depression, uh, but when it just lingers and, you know, it doesn't, you're not getting anywhere at all. You know, for instance, some people withdraw. So now they don't want to be around anybody at all. Um, some people get really, uh, you know, they lash out, you know, in some ways. Um, some people just, uh, just sad all the time. So, you know, there are things people can do you know, again, those around you want to support you and help you um, and reach out to you. And that's one thing. And you. But you need to also take the step to reach out to them. Yeah. Because and so many people won't and they don't want to burden people right. or they're embarrassed right. and, and don't want to let people know how, how they really feel. 
Yes. And just know that if you're listening to this and you do feel like you've been in that depression stage, reach out to somebody, no matter who it is, you know, yeah. a friend yeah. or a neighbor, when people know they're more willing to try to help or find you help. Yes. You know, and help and I can't you. say enough about groups. I really am big on groups because people don't understand. They love you and your friends adore you. But, you know, a group that has gone through the same thing really understands what you're going through. And so if you can get yourself into something where at least you don't feel completely alone. Yeah. You know, that's a, a, a step. That's a step. And so it's that's where, you know, we are a little different in that. And I, but I can appreciate that because just because I wasn't into the groups, I didn't want to be in the groups. I didn't want to hear anybody else's story. I can relate to that, to what you're saying, Lisa, in other ways, you know, when things have happened in, in my own life um, and it can be, it can be simple things like um, last year, I was able to reverse type two, di type two diabetes. But it helped me tremendously to be around people that were doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yep. So yep. I constantly was looking for the value, value in education in groups and videos and books because, you know, they're knowing and liking and wanting to learn the same thing. So and it's, it's like that with several things in my life, too, where I always find that by gravitating to those certain people it's a support system. Yes. Right. It's a really yes. good support system for you. Yes. Yes. So watch out, know yourself when it's going on for much too long um, or with somebody and, else in your life. Yeah. And the much too long is a funny term because I know, I know. Keep, and, I thought about that when to, I said it. I want us to say it. I want us to say it out loud. Okay. Because mm. people say, oh, aren't you over it already? It's been a year, you know, or hey, wait a minute. Yeah. It's been a couple months. You know, so your journey is your own. And the problem with depression is that when it overtakes your whole life and you're unable then to function and and it starts really eating at you to the point where where, you know, you're not even living at all. OK, it's difficult now, to get through your day. Still. Correct. Correct. And you'll know that time is you. You'll know for that. You know, and people, you know, people are depressed, but there's different levels of depression too. You know, I might get depressed over something because I saw, and it, you reminded me of something, but that was more of a momentary thing. Then you have depression that lasts to the point where you can't even function. So it's a relative thing and we can't just put a label on, well, you're in trouble now or you're, you're fine now. We can't do that, but we can say, just look at yourself and see how how you're operating and as i said in the beginning the pain is just overwhelming it's overwhelming it's so it's it it tugs at your heart you know because life is different and life will never be the people keep saying life will never be the same it just can't be it can't be so you know we're here to say you'll create your new life but that is a journey and that is your process so the depression is part of it and as that rabbi said, if you didn't cry those tears, then you'd wonder whether you actually felt anything for that person. So the measure of a person's love for somebody is in the tears that you cry. And some people can't even cry tears because they're not good at that. They don't know how to let go. Okay. So everybody does that differently. Um, let's, but, move, let's, let's just hit the, on the last stage before yep. we go on a little yep. bit. Yep. So that would be acceptance. And to me, that's a word that that I can't even believe that's a word that they use for the last stage. Acceptance. OK, I've okay. accepted it and move on. No, it doesn't happen that way. But the final state, it happens when you begin to heal from the pain and sadness that you've been suffering from for so long. And when the acceptance piece, when the acceptance piece doesn't occur, um, it, it really is a sign that you should reach out for help, just like we talked about a few minutes ago. Right. And as the internal sadness of your grief might stay with you for the rest of your life, you'll know the difference if you're not seeing any light in your future, 
instead of being consumed in a world that's filled with darkness right. and despair. Right. right, 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 right. So acceptance is a, is a, uh, I don't like mm. the term. Mm. I know. I know. But it's accepting, it's accepting the loss and saying, I can say now that, well, I could say this a few years ago too, but I could honestly say now that I know he's not on that road trip and still coming home and pulling in the driveway at night. I've accepted that he's, his journey was over. Mm -hmm. And while I have all my own thought beliefs and spiritual beliefs on that, mm -hmm. that we won't mm -hmm. get into here, but I've accepted um, the situation for what it is right now. And I'm gonna take it one step further. In acceptance, yeah. you actually see a new life, carving a new life for yourself without that yeah. person. Yeah. So whatever that means, and you haven't, you haven't forgotten that person, you keep them with you forever. And I say that, and I truly mean it. They live in your heart forever and you do things that perhaps can, you know, bring the memories still with you, but that you see a life that is different. That's not what we thought we would lead, but that we now are open to a life afterwards. And I call that moving on. That's my and job. That's right. Moving on, but but a new Never, life. That's right. A, new, a new way. That's right. right. That's right. I'll give and you an you example. Know, I'm going to give yeah. you an example, okay? Go ahead. I watch this program called Going RV, okay? It's on, it's on TV. And um, my husband and I loved our RV. We got it in 1999. I sold it in 2009. Um, and for 10 years, it was an amazing life. And we dreamed that we would become full-time RVers, okay? He wanted to drive the bus. It was going to be a big 40-foot bus. He was going to pull something. I said to him, there's no way I'm driving that thing. But he would have, he would have done it, okay? And when he died, I sold it. I sold the RV, and it was heartbreaking. But I said, I don't know if somebody else is going to want to do this RV thing with me. So I sold it, got some money, and I needed the money anyway. I watch Going RV and it is bittersweet because I look at these couples that have decided to go full time or they're camping or they're fifth wheeling or whatever it is. And it's bittersweet because of course I remember all those memories, but I know that it's not the life that I'm living now, nor is it going to be. My partner doesn't want to do that and would not buy an RV and do that. But I enjoy still looking at that life and seeing what it what it was now is it bittersweet yeah and is there some kind of sadness that you know it couldn't be that sure but that doesn't but there's take acceptance up. there's right. acceptance there's in acceptance. that situation correct. that it didn't correct. work out the way i hoped the way correct. i expected the way correct. i wanted correct however <laughs> it's okay and you correct. can love and appreciate that now correct right? correct exactly Lisa, for some people, um, you know, our friends out there watching now need to know that um, it, death is not so overwhelming for them. And it doesn't have such an impact on them, you know, the whole grieving thing. And again, we, we want to reiterate that it really depends on their relationship, um, their spiritual beliefs, right, their faith. Uh, and the relationship they had, and the relationship right. they had with that person, because there could be unresolved yeah. things that That's now I mean. are going to be there forever. You know, there's a lot of situations for people. And by the way, guilt. By the way, guilt. I should have done this if I'd said this. And, you know, all that stuff is wrapped up in those things too. By the way, okay, because yeah. people do go over and over what they could have done, should have done, would have done. Whatever. So when it comes to guilt, there can be no judging involved because you don't know. Maybe they let, lost 10 people before that person and they've come to a spiritual awareness that um, they take with them moving forward in every loss now that that they uh, come across, come across. That, that yes. sounds shallow. Um, but just know that 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 not everybody will grieve all of these stages. Right. That's that's our point here. Right. And, you know, they say if you read and we read in places and study and our schooling, right, that grief can last anywhere from six months to, to several years and can last through a lifetime, you know, when a person allows it to or lets it. But as you progress, 
as time moves on, you will find yourself feeling a little bit better with yeah. each new day. Yeah. Right. You, you know, people, right. So people always ask, so how long am I going to grieve? You know, and there's no answer. We start out with that question. There's no real answer to the question um, because it depends upon you and depends upon the circumstances and everything that's happened in your life. But we posted something a while ago and I don't remember where it is, but it was about grief over time. And I just want to describe it because it's so true. So there are these jars. They represent life. They're like, they look like mason jars, you know? And you have your jar and you have this ball of grief, okay? And the first set believes that grief just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And there's your jar, okay? So the grief ball gets smaller and smaller. That's actually not how it happens. So the way it really happens is that your jar of life gets larger and larger. Grief may stay the same because it's part of your life, but the rest of your life becomes more. And I love that analogy because it really demonstrates that you are living your life and that you're continuing to live and that grief will always be with you in some way, but it won't take over your whole life. That's exactly. how I see it. And, That's you know, when I hear that story, because I've heard it before, you know, I just got the chills and I, and I got um, a five second little stint just now of overwhelming grief, just hearing that story, you know, that overwhelming sadness that I could cry. Yeah. Yeah. But, but that's okay because yes. I'll continue on. I'll finish my video today. I see a client this afternoon. Yes. Like we know that this is a part of life. So those feelings will stay. And we've heard about the waves, right? Yes. The waves. Yes. yes. And this is true. So know that it's true. One day you're going to feel fine and feel like, wow, I function pretty normal. Normally today, I actually got in the car and went to the grocery store and I felt the sun on my face. Yes. And it felt good. And I've got this. And you're going back to, you know, feeling great, like a normal person again. And then all of a sudden, you know, the roller coaster comes or the wave comes. And the next day you're going back to where you felt a right. few weeks ago. Right. And you're confused. Right. And you're wondering. Or, or triggers or triggers. It it's could be something that this. reminds you. It could be, you know, a date. It could be a place. It could be anything that right. reminds you. And that comes back again in a wave, but the process of now moving, you know, where you can move along and you can feel more of a life in front of you, as opposed to what was behind you. Right. That's, you know, and just by listening in today, okay, you're finding ways to counteract your grief along the way. You're educating a little bit exercising can help you do this as well because you know find what you like and what's right for you but with certain exercises you can feel this sense of relief um, like you've been able to vent or let go and release even for a short time and I'll tell you I, you know I wasn't feeling myself yesterday and I had to go to the store and I had to do this and had to do that and still so many years later I'm, I'm beginning to know my own mind and my body. And I thought, wow, it's four o'clock in the afternoon. And if I'm still feeling this way, I, I put on the sneakers, I got my headphones and I went out for an hour walk. Mm. And I knew that just by doing that, it, was, it would take over. The sun would be shining on my face. I'd be breathing heavy and my body would feel better. And it did, and it worked. Nice. So something as simple as taking a walk, if you don't have a punching bag and you don't box or wrestle or play tennis or, mm -hmm. you know, take a walk because that will help too. And, yeah. maybe, you know, you got to be gentle with yourself. You do. You do. Journaling really helps. I think writing, I mean, I'm a writer and I love writing. And so writing a letter or writing feelings down or something in some way, that really helps as well. Calling up a friend, you know, talking to somebody, just, just saying, hey, you know, this is how I'm feeling right now. And I just wanted, I just wanted a voice. You know, right. I just wanted somebody who knows me and who cares about me. It's a process. Yes. And you have to go 
through it in order to come out of it. Yeah, and I'm going to tell you what happens to people who don't, okay, because I've seen it. There are people who harness all this energy in, in anger or in, in denial and everything else. And so what happens is it takes over their lives yeah. and it prevents them from communicating with other people, from living, from doing anything else. Families, you know, because families grieve differently and everybody's different and families become, you know, there's a rift between them. There's a lot. If you don't really allow yourself to truly grieve, I say to people all the time, please, this is a gift to yourself and a, and a present to the person who left. This is the time period of mourning them and of losing them, but that going through this process, so important to get to the other side. You have to, right. you have to. Exactly. Yeah. And you, that, that was well said. Um, yeah. Simple techniques like deep breathing and right. meditation are tools that you could bring in now during this immediate grieving process. Meditation music. If you have access to YouTube or on some of the music stations now on your TV, look for meditation or spa music. Um, I happen to find that a powerful tool that I used after, after my losses uh, in my life because I found that it was so peaceful and it reduced some of my anxiety levels. And all I wanted after these losses, I just wanted to feel peace, peace. I, I, I still say the word every day. Mm -hmm. And you can find the peace if you find the tools to bring into your life and utilize them. You can also sit on the couch and do nothing. Sure. But by sure. hearing some of the tools we're giving you, try them. It might be the perfect one for you. Yes. Yes. And right? now it's spring and people really like to plant. There's some real garden people that love to be outside and digging in the dirt and planting bulbs and whatever else. Um, and so that is also very therapeutic for people as well. Um, and also try to accept some um, some help. You know, when people bring in food or people say, hey, let me just take you for a walk or let's just, you know, if you can try to embrace that, it's difficult, especially when you're in that dark place. But if you can try to move a little bit, a little at a time, you know, I'm not yeah. saying just, you know, go out and have a party, right. but, you know, because people are there and people care about you. you and they're, and by the way, they're wondering what they can do as well. People wrote oh, down in one of the sites, um, you why do people say stupid things? You know, people say stupid things. And, and I responded, they don't know what to say. <laughs> That's the problem. They don't know what to say. You know, it's very hard. Like, you know, what do you say that makes it better? You know? On my social media calendar this month, Lisa, um, I'm focused on the theme is what not to say, you know, mm. what to say and what not to say yeah. during somebody's time of loss, because the words matter and words are really, really important. They do. Um, you know, and it's very common for a person during this time of grieving too, to form a deeper connection with their spirituality or higher power or the universe or the light, whatever it may be, or God. Um, but it helps people to move forward especially with with unexpected losses you know that's a very common for for people to gravitate to but you know we just really want you to know that there there are no rules yep that's so, right again yeah. grieving different people in your life suffering um different pain points and and circumstances it's all different and it, it will happen slow and it'll happen in your time. And you just need to know that at some point you'll adjust to the new. You will adjust to the new. Go easy on yourself, especially despite any, um, any pressure that mm -hmm. the outside world that mm -hmm. your family or your friends give you that isn't it time to move on? You know, yeah. we yeah. talk about that a lot, Lisa and yeah. I. And again, going back to the power of words. So for those of you who are not grieving, think about your words, choose your words wisely, because even if somebody had the most hardest relationship, whether it be a spouse or with somebody in their life, 
it's easy for you as an outsider to think, okay, well, it wasn't that good anyway. And, mm -hmm. you know, move on, you know, it, it's okay. But it's not because a lot of times people who've, who've gone through the loss um, see the person who's gone, see all their really, really good qualities yeah. and remember the wonderful things that they right. shared together. Right. Because no matter what, they're gone and it's not That's fair. Right. That's and right. And you feel bad and you feel sad for them. So yeah. you're still seeing the good. That's and true. I think that you have to be more conscious of the way that you relate. relate it's that. complicated. And we've said before, just really for those people who are supporting, listen, really listen carefully. And it's better not to say how you're doing than to just say thinking of you. You know, this way it doesn't put them in a position of saying, well, how do you think I'm thinking? You know, how do you think I'm feeling? You know, um, so you know, exactly. I'm thinking of you. I'm reaching yeah, out grief, to you. Grief, Lisa, as you know, and I know, and so many people know, it can be an all-consuming yes. full-time job. Yes. It really is. It's not that people are sitting in the, laying in bed was sitting on the couch, eating bonbons, watching Lifetime. You know, it's not that, it's not, not about that. It's, it's a hard job. Nobody wants this job, right? But you were given this job and it's our hope, Lisa and mine, it's our hope that by knowing how grief works just a little bit, like we were able to show you today, it will help you in your own healing journey. Yes, you know, and that's our intention. Absolutely. And talking about that, tell us yeah. a little bit about your healing garden, because I think that's really a unique ah. product <laughs> that is a way of uh, grieving. Tell us about that. So you can go to the healinggardenbowl.com or you can go on to Etsy and uh, search the healing garden. So the healing garden is just um, a bowl that I've come up with filled with about a dozen stones, the Long Island stones, uh, with beautiful phrases on them to help your friend who's going through a grieving period. And I have directions on the bottom of each bowl. It's doing short meditations, maybe twice a day, five minutes in the morning, five at night, meditating on the little phrase, sitting still, being still with yourself, reflecting, reviewing, acknowledging the the space that you're in right now nice so, and explain yeah. the circumstances also i think you have certain things for certain circumstances explain yeah there are different things. themes so believe it or not lisa of all the themes i've been um people have been reaching out to me for the grieving balls yeah. that's been my biggest theme um i also came up with one for cancer if you have a friend with a cancer diagnosis one for spirituality, one for just inspiration, inspirational quotes and phrases, uh, and also pet loss. Pet yeah. loss is, is huge. It right? is huge. Oh. The family members. Yep. So the special message is about your special breed and your special friend that you've lost. Nice. So you can find that all on there. But I wanted to just mention one thing, since this is our video, Lisa. Yes. Uh, so I've also started something, something with families now called um, a grief ceremony. Okay. And it's really powerful because it's not a, a group, a bereavement group that you go to. It's not a one-on-one. -on -one. It's something you'd hold in the comforting, safe space of your own home whether it be in your living room, around your dining room table, with just immediate family members. And I go through a series of steps, uh, different things that we do, different messages that we write. We talk about stories, we laugh, we cry, we, we bond. But it gives the family a foundation, a little platform to start their bonding and their connecting a little nice. bit more than they could have before. Nice. And this is really important for families to do together because it's very easy to disconnect and to, to separate. You yeah. know, I've known that to happen in the past. Mm -hmm. So, and you're also an end of life doula. So talk about some of the legacy stuff that you do as well. Yeah, so as a doula, I work with terminally um, ill clients. Uh, one of the specialties that I bring in are the, the legacy pieces. 
And in that, I, I also help with help, work, work with healthy and vibrant people to leave their stories and experiences through this legacy project as well. And it's a four week project. We get together, I take all your audio, I transform it into a beautiful hardcover book with photos and text for future generations to come. And Lisa, let's nice. hear about you. Well, also let's share the fact that we also do life celebrations. Mm -hmm. And so we've helped people um, who want to uh, memorialize um, in some kind of party kind of thing. And we help yeah. develop and create uh, the um, beautiful experience. event and experience. We're very good. And note that that can be before a loss or yeah. after a loss. Yes. We prefer it to be yes. while the person's still here and they yes. can join in their own celebration and festivities. Yes, yes. Nice. Um, so as a bereavement specialist, I know death well, and I help people with their journeys. And I do one to one or groups. I love doing workshops as well. And I also have two books. And both of them are on behalf of the Lusgarten Foundation, which uh, is the world's largest not for profit, um, doing all the research to try and come up with a cure and eventual um, early detection of pancreatic cancer. So those books are on Amazon and or they can contact me uh, as well. So I know you have books as well. Wonderful. Uh, yeah. That's great, Lisa. Yeah. And this was great today. And this was a topic that, um, you know, that, that many people need to know, yes. need to know about the process of grief and what they will go through. And there's no time limits. There's no rules. Right. This is your journey and trust in your journey. That's right. And I hope this has been helpful to people and we really understand. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you for coming. Okay, so till next week. Till next week. Okay, take care. Bye, thank you. Bye.